Hey guys, Wayback Rewind here. It's an exciting day here at Wayback Rewind. Today we are going to unbox and test out a brand new camcorder. It's been over seven years since I bought a brand new camera, camcorder specifically, and this is a 4K camcorder from Panasonic. Brand new, out of the box. I'll be unboxing it here, and testing it out, and seeing how it compares to some of the other cameras that I have in my inventory. Coming up next, here on Wayback Rewind. Hey guys, welcome back. It's an exciting day here at Wayback Rewind. We have here a brand new camcorder. This is the first new camcorder that I've bought in seven years. And you know we love camcorders here at Wayback Rewind. And brand new camcorders is not something that I get every day. And it's my first 4K camcorder. And I'm gonna open it here live We'll see how it works together. Here we go. It's my brand new five-year-old camera. The Panasonic WX-F1. So let me tell you about this camera. It came out in January of 2018. But Panasonic doesn't have a lot of love for consumer level camcorders. This camera came out in January of 2018. It's still sold brand new. They do not have anything else in their lineup equivalent to this. It's a 4K twin camera. The twin camera is kind of goofy. Don't really need that, but it's a it's a 4K camcorder. My very first ever 4k camcorder and I'll tell you why I bought it so this is the last brand new camcorder that I bought seven years ago the Panasonic HC V180 I love this camera it's full HD it's very small if you're going on vacation or something you can put this in your pocket this battery will run for hours you can carry extra batteries and basically what I wanted was a 4K version of this camera. And as I said earlier, Panasonic has pretty much forsaken the consumer camcorder market. But the WX-F1 is the closest I could find to a consumer 4K camcorder that would be an upgrade for this. It's even better, aside from the fact that it's 4K, it has a viewfinder. This one does not. Is a somewhat larger screen and it has a multifunction ring on the front. I have yet to open this so we're gonna see in real time what this camera consists of. This is the very first time I've ever opened this brand new camera. My brand new five-year-old camera. Okay. I usually like to draw this out as much as possible. There's a ring. It's in bubble wrap and some kind of absorbent tissue paper and instructions. There are three models. The VX1 does not have the screen. Okay. Might as well not drag it out any longer. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen. The WXF1. What I love about this camera, what I love about it, it actually uses the same battery as this one. My V180 battery uses the same battery. So not only is this the spiritual upgrade to this camera, it literally uses the same battery. And 
has a very large ring here on the front. It has this dual screen. It's kind of a gimmick, but the only way to get the viewfinder is to go with the dual screen. You can see how much bigger that is. It's a touch screen, of course. This does, does come out, does angle up. Just like the 180, it has a power cord here. That power cord essentially is 5 volt USB. You can plug that into any 5 volt USB and it will charge. Despite the fact that it has a USB here on the side, So you can see it's just a tiny bit bigger. This is the spiritual successor to the 180. Let's see what else we got in here. got a USB brick. There's that cable I was talking about. It goes from USB to the mini coaxial power. USB brick here. HDMI. It goes from the mini, the sub microscopic mini HDMI to full size HDMI. Like, what was in here? Oh, the battery. Battery fell out bag. But as I already pointed out, the battery is identical to the one from my V80. Of course, I have to mark these. I have so many batteries. I would not be able to keep track otherwise. And what is this? This is an old school USB to Type A. And that's it. We reached the bottom of the box. Well, there you have it. The unboxing of the brand new Panasonic WX F1. Install this ring. This multifunction ring here depends on what you're pushing. The ring installation is complete. And now I'm going to power up the Debbie XF1 for the first time ever. Battery, open the door, turn it on. Set home region and time. Okay, we're not in Miami. Houston, yes to Houston. Clock set. Notice the clock starts at 2018. Oops. They ship these with the battery almost dead. Okay, I'm going to put my authentic Panasonic battery on here. Starts at 2018. Clock set. Uh, what time is it? 
Alexa, what time is it? about not having a card. I do have a card. It's only a 32. I'll have to try it out. Battery's in good shape. Let's see how it smells. Let's see if it has that new camcorder smell. It does. It has that new camcorder smell that you only get from a new camcorder. These controls all feel very familiar. You've got the menu, record setup, picture setup. So let's automatically go into picture size. I want the largest one they have. Is it 20 meg? Yeah, I want that, of course. Record setup. Zoom mode, 24, you yeah, have optical zoom of 24, but it will do this intelligent zoom up to 32, record format, 4K, why would I want anything else, 24P, I can actually do 2160, 24P, that's kind of cool, but I'm going to pretty much always shoot in 4K. Baby calendar. So the parent audience for this are consumers. Set the baby's name and date of birth. Let's see how far back it'll let me go. Well, it works for Gen Z at least. Well, maybe not. It only goes back to 2000. I guess they figure once your baby's 23, you don't need this anymore. Autofocus, normal. Pre-record, yes. Face framing, all. Hybrid OIS, on. Double shot, yes. Fade color, I don't need fade. Guidelines, I like guidelines. Let's do thirds, rule of thirds is pretty much what you always want. Level gauge, on. AGS. On. I pretty much turn everything on. Okay, let's look up here. Cold shoe. This feels super flimsy, but uh, not crazy about that. Let's shoot some 2160, see how that works. Why did the recording stop? I don't remember pressing the button. It doesn't like the card. It's too slow of a card. Figures. This card should be fast enough. It's a 512. It should give me enough room. How do you play back? You press the playback button. And there's my two clips. Okay, the unboxing video was my first impressions of this camera just by messing around with it. I took several days, went through the entire detailed user guide, 281 pages, read through it several times, took several pages of notes. I'm going to dig into some of the features. I've got the good, the bad, and the ugly. A lot of pros, several cons, several nice but I will probably never use type features. And I will explain some things that just simply don't work anymore because 
This camera came out in January 2018. It's still being sold brand new here in 2023. There are some drawbacks to that. There literally are things that were built into this camera that simply no longer work because they rely on infrastructure that Panasonic no longer supports. And I'll get into that in a minute, but I'm gonna start with the good news. I'm gonna start with the things that I like about this camera. And I'll remind everyone, I bought this camera with my own money. It's not cheap. MSRP is $1,400. Street price is closer to $850. They just reduced the price by about 15%, and that's what got me off the fence. I'll talk later about who this camera is for. I mean, this is, if you want a camcorder, this is a pretty nice camcorder. It's got more features than I will ever use. Anyway, let's get started. So I'm going to start with the good. The first thing that I really like is it has four programmable buttons. This is in no particular order. I'm just gonna go through some of the features that it has. I'm gonna go over the four buttons. Here, 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 and here. This button here, I have no idea what that button is really there for. This button presumably goes between record video, 4K photo, and still mode. First of all, you can go into photo mode just by pressing this and going into photo mode down here. And then once you're in photo mode, you can go into video mode automatically by pressing the video button. So I can go back and forth between photo mode and video mode without ever touching that button. Yeah, it's a touch screen and you think, okay, having a button is better. It also goes between 4K photo. Now, the purpose of 4K photo is that instead of shooting video, you're shooting 30 frames per second of photos. Now that makes sense on a camera in which those photos are actually stored as photos. The way it's implemented on this camera is really pointless. It stores the 4K photos as a video, a 30p 4K video that is indistinguishable from any other 4K 30p video that you're gonna take with this camera. So 4K photo does absolutely nothing. So I immediately reprogrammed this button to be backlight compensation, something that's actually useful. The HDR button. HDR sounds like a nice feature, but HDR does not work in 4K mode. That's one of the many things that does not work in 4K mode, just just simply doesn't work. I mean, I've got a list of things here that that don't work in 4K mode, and it's it's a long list. So I changed this HDR button to be pre-record on. Pre-record on means that when I press, so when I press go, it's gonna start recording at four seconds, meaning it's already recorded three seconds. Now the downside to this, you have to press it each and every single time after you hit stop. So I reprogrammed it to one of these buttons down here. Now you can see the counter here is at zero. When I hit go, it's already gonna have three seconds in the can. And you have to press that each and every time you hit stop. That's a nice feature to help you to not miss anything. So I went over the programmable buttons. It has a headphone jack and it has a microphone line in jack. Notice I said microphone and line in. It's switchable in the menu. You can switch between line in and microphone in. That's really nice. And it also has a place to plug in a charger. It charges from a regular old five volt USB. It charges more quickly through here, but it literally also has a USB input here that it will charge through as well. But back to the microphone line input. This camera actually has a lot more audio features than I expected. The audio features were more extensive than I expected. Here's another caveat. In 4K mode, all you get is stereo. So you're stuck with that. But if you're using AVC HD in 1080, you get 5.1 audio. You can Your microphones can be in surround mode, zoom. A lot of audio features here that I really like. And also has a clean HDMI output. It has the mini HDMI, and it includes the mini HDMI cable, which is nice. You can send that directly to your TV or to an HDMI recorder if you have one. Now, since I'm looking at the USB here, the nice thing about this USB is you can connect it directly to your computer, and even more unexpectedly, you can connect this directly to a hard drive, and you can copy the videos and photos directly to a hard drive. Now, another caveat there is it has to be a two terabyte or less, and it will format that hard drive, so it has to be a blank hard drive or one that you're willing to make blank before you can copy anything to it. And then that hard drive becomes sort of married to this camera. You can no longer 
plug that hard drive into a computer. You can only use it to move images and photos directly between this camera and the hard drive. That's kind of a neat feature. I mentioned the USB charging. It can also supply power through this port for connecting like the aforementioned hard drives. It can be a USB powered hard drive and it will run off that port, which is kind of nice. The twin camera is kind of gimmicky. I'm gonna open this up. It is there. It does have night mode. I get that question a lot. People are very interested in night mode. They go, does this camera have night mode? Yes, it does. Not only does it have night mode, it has infrared night mode, so it can shoot in complete darkness, but it's very cleverly hidden. The only way to access it is to program it to one of the aforementioned four programmable buttons. So we're gonna do that right now. You have to go to setup, function, button setting, Right now, function one is Wi-Fi. We're gonna temporarily make that night mode, which is the moon and the star. Okay, we're gonna exit out of that. I'm gonna dim down these lights so I don't burn it out. Okay, I'm gonna go to manual. Okay, now I'm gonna press this button for night mode. It's super bright. I'm gonna turn off most of my lights here. See, night mode is working. Now I'm in infrared night mode. It's kind of hard to tell, but I have turned off all the lights in this room. There are literally, it is literally pitch black. There's no light in here. This does have an infrared illuminator, so it can shoot in complete darkness in night mode once you've programmed night mode to a button. If you didn't read the manual, you wouldn't even know this camera had night mode, but it literally does. I'm going to turn night mode off. Turn my lights back on so I can see what I'm doing here. Okay, another nice feature this camera has is called level shot. I'm in 4K, so it won't give me strong, but it, at least it has a normal level shot. I'll select normal. And basically what that means is if I move the camera slightly off level, it will compensate for that and the image will not move as much as it normally would. Another nice feature is face framing. I have it set to all. You can say primary, all, or off. But basically what that face framing does is it, the camera is smart enough. It uses AI to recognize when there's a face. And it will prioritize the focus and brightness with respect to the faces. If you say all, it will average it across any face that it sees. Primary is if you're shooting one person and there may be people in the background and you don't want it to be distracted or you can just turn it off. I leave it set to all. This camera has a ring on the front which is really nice. By default it's set to zoom. There's a button down here. It's not programmable. But it says camera function. I press it once and that ring is now set to focus. And for some reason, I have to press this manual button to actually make it do that. But now you can see this ring, this ring that I'm turning now actually focuses the camera. If I press that button again, it'll go to iris. And now this, this ring is now iris. So just by pressing those two buttons up front, this manual ring on the front can become iris, focus, or zoom. Having a manual ring on the front of the camera is better than not having it, of course. I have it set to manual so I can show you all of these features. If the camera were in auto, it wouldn't let me show you all the features that I want to show you. When it lights up blue like that, it's in focus. Go back to zoom. And that's the zoom ring. It also has a different speed adjustment. Right now, the way I have it set up, the faster you turn this ring, the faster it zooms. But it also has a couple of fixed speeds, either slow or fast. I have it set up to respond more like a manual ring. Now, I'm gonna talk about some of the things that don't work anymore. Wi-Fi is another one of those features that unless you have it set to a button, there is no way to use it at all. So you have to put it on a programmable button. So I'm gonna reprogram that button back to Wi-Fi. So now I turn the Wi-Fi on. I have a bunch of options. Unfortunately, 
baby monitor, home cam, and live cast no longer work. And let me say that again. When this camera was originally launched in 2018, Panasonic had a deal with Ustream and they also had a deal with Lumix Club. You could automatically link this camera to the internet and it could be used as a baby monitor to monitor your home and to do live casting through Ustream. None of that is supported anymore. It was supported all the way up through May of 2022, which may explain why this camera just became 15% less expensive. Those features, there may be some third party support you could use to live stream, but it no longer can be done the way it's described in the manual. Now the one thing that still works is link to cell. Link to cell does work. I'm over here linking it to my cell phone. So you can do a direct connection to an access point, which is a router or to a phone. None of the internet functions work as originally envisioned. There's no such thing as Lumix Club anymore. Ustream was bought by AT&T and their deal with Panasonic has ended and Home Monitor is not going to work. Let's see if we can do connection to an access point. I finally got the smartphone connection working. It's very finicky. What we see here, move this off to the side a little bit. About the only feature that works with respect to Wi-Fi is that I can do a direct connection to a cell phone, either through an access point, i.e. a router, or a direct Wi-Fi connection. Either way, I now have basically a remote control. I've got zoom control here. I can now initiate record, stop, I can go between video and photo mode. In photo mode, I can now take pictures. And that's about it. That's about all I can do. But the baby monitor, the home cam, the live streaming, the cloud sync, up uploading images to the web, none of that works. However, I will tell you that HD Rider AE 5.4 can still be downloaded and will be supported through August 2027. All right, so let's, that's enough of Wi-Fi. So this has three photo modes. One of the things you'll see on this camera, I've already talked about it a few times, but you will see this a lot. Cannot be used in 4K MP4 format. So scene modes, forget it. HDR. You can forget it. It has a lot of things called creative control. We can use miniature effects, 8mm movie, silent movie, time lapse. None of that works in 4K. Cinema like effects, slow and quick video, slow motion, slow zoom, dolly zoom. None of that works in 4K. Stop motion, forget it. Only works in 1920 by 1080. I talked about the 5.1 audio doesn't work in 4K and digital cinema color does not work in 4K. I've rattled off a lot of things that don't work after I went through some of the good things that I like. In terms of the photo modes, I talked about how 4K photo is really not even a mode. It's just shooting regular 4K video, no different from any other 4K video. So in terms of still images, this has several different modes. The highest resolution is 25.9 megapixels when it's in full up photo mode. If you happen to be in video mode and want to take a picture, it will take a 20.4 megapixel picture when the video is stopped. And another thing that doesn't work, if you happen to be recording, it will not take a simultaneous record photo at all when it's in 4K mode. If you're recording in a lower resolution mode, you can take simultaneous photos, but in 4K video, you cannot take simultaneous photos at all while the camera is recording. So you have to stop recording in order to take a picture when you're in video mode. I've got these batteries here. It uses the same batteries as the 180. I've got a 512 memory card in here. It can hold about 16 hours of video. I can take this camera out on the town, on vacation, all day long and shoot video without running my phone down. That's primarily why I bought this. I wish it were smaller. 
it's not appreciably smaller than this 24 year old mini DV camera to be honest with you it's it might even be larger so I'm not exactly sure why it's as bulky as it is I wish it were as small as the V180 but it's not I don't know why the lens is so large maybe it's to improve the light gathering capability or to get the 24 optical and 32 digital zoom but it does have a nice zoom which is one of the huge advantages over a cell phone so who is this camera for I'm guessing it's for people like me that just want a casual camera that can shoot all day long with extra memory and extra batteries no cell phone these days has a removable battery or a removable memory card so I can literally have unlimited shooting capabilities all day long with a very beefy zoom lens and that's primarily why I bought this and Panasonic and Sony and Canon or no one JVC really has come out with a consumer level camcorder in years this is the newest camcorder that Panasonic has on their website for the consumer they reduced it by 15 percent this year probably because of all of those software issues that are no longer supported it felt overpriced at its original list price 15 percent off it was kind of on the fence You're like yeah probably is of relatively good value at that price to be honest with you it'd be better at an even cheaper price finally bought it new after the discount and sort of felt like it was in the right price range I'm gonna keep it most likely I like it even though there's a laundry list of things it cannot do in 4k but I didn't buy it to be cinematic I bought it basically just to record vacations and, and whatnot I didn't go over every feature in detail this would have been a two-hour long video I think it would have been too boring but if you have any questions about any of the things I've talked about or any of the things that you know this camera can do that I didn't mention put it in the comments I'll do my best to answer it and if there's a significant number of things that I missed I can make a follow-up video hopefully you found this interesting this was my first brand new camera review on Wayback Rewind I did a, did want to give it a thorough understanding there's a 281 page owner's manual I've read it twice I don't know that I know how to work everything and the list of things it cannot do is probably longer than the things it can do if you stick to 4k which is how I intend to use this 4k all the time and so none of the creative things that I talked about work in 4k that's a little disappointing but that being said it does do 4k 30p 3840 by 2160 and that's primarily why I bought it you found this helpful as always please like or subscribe to my channel and thanks for watching